Okay, the third installment of what we're calling Myco University. Just a chance for staff and volunteers to uh, get some basic uh, biology and ecology information. And um, so today we're actually starting with what I would call the principles of ecology. I broke it down into four, uh, two classes and it's uh, four topics. So if you remember, of course you remember, uh, two months ago when we were talking about the levels of organization in living systems, we said then that um, you had uh, one, one of the levels was populations. Oh, once you close yourself out, you can't get back in. Come on in. Well, it didn't help that the door was locked. So. <laughs> um, so some of those levels, um, populations, communities, ecosystems, and biomes, those are all within the realm of what we would call ecology. And ecology is just that part, uh, part of biology that seeks to study uh, the relationship that living things have with each other and with their environment. So uh, living things, living organisms, and their reactions with each other and their environment. And it happens on these four levels. So today we're just gonna be talking about populations and communities. So what is by definition, a population. So <clears throat> we can't help but when we hear you know, words like this, we, we tend to bring in the human aspect of it. And certainly, human population is valid, and we conform to that. But uh, who knows uh, exactly what the formal definition of a population is when you're talking in biological terms? Members of a community is what I was. Well, they certainly can be. I was actually uh, pointing daggers at uh, Morgan back there. She ought to know too. So. <laughs> I think we should pass it off to John. Wow. <laughs> Isn't a group of the same animal in a given ecosystem or something like that? Okay, so by definition, population is all members of the same species, I think is where you were heading with that living in the same place at the same time. So in order to be a population, y'all have to be the same species. Well, of course, when we talk about the human population, we're all the same species. All right, there's different races of us, but we're all the same species. Meaning, and by definition, species meaning able to interbreed and produce viable offspring. <clears throat> and the reason I put this picture up here is because again, you know, not all, not all people, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of people tend to be a little more animal-centric than, than plant-centric, but of course, plants are living things too. So you're looking at a population here, and this happens to be the Schweinitz sunflower population out at Historic Brattonsville. Uh, this picture was taken uh, probably around the year 2000, 2001, right after, the, this is the first year after the population was established out there. So this is an endangered sunflower, which means there aren't that many populations of them. However, uh, this constitutes a population because they're all the same species, they're in the same place at virtually the same time. And more importantly, they can reproduce with one another via cross-pollination. So, so <clears throat> one of the dynamics of populations is that obviously they change over time. Sometimes they grow, Sometimes they don't, but a lot of times it's an oscillation or a, a cycle or, and there's different ways that can happen. So one way we think about growth is by simply adding members to the population, addition. And that's, that would be called arithmetic growth. That's usually not something you see with living things, okay? we can say that the number of cars is increased by addition every day. So in a factory, we have uh, a graph here, and we, if, if every day the number of cars was increased by a thousand, that'd be incredible, wouldn't it? Um, then we would say that's arithmetic. And when you plot that on a graph, it's linear. It's a straight line, okay? Because time and number of individuals is what would be on the, the axes of the graph. So that's just a straight line, a linear. But that's not usually the way living populations work. 
Living populations aren't usually linear, they grow by multiplication. And so you get a, a very quick upturn, what's called exponential growth. So if you looked at, say, the population of, of water fleas over a period of time, and instead of adding, they, say, doubled every reproductive cycle, you can see how those numbers drastically increase from 1,000 to 2 to 4 and so on. And so this is what we typically expect with living things, especially very small organisms like insects and, and arthropods and things like that. So <clears throat> what can we present that says this is a model of population dynamics? Okay, and it, it, it is that, guys. It is a model. So when I say that it's a model, what does that mean for the real world? representation it's a representation it's a reference don't expect everything in the real world to conform to this rather it's a general expression of a concept or an idea okay it has validity but it's not going to be applied in every single case so if you plot individuals on one side of the graph and time on the what's called the x-axis if you remember graphing terminology in living systems in the environment, there's always going to be something called carrying capacity. Now, that is probably self-explanatory just by the name, but what do you think carrying capacity means with regard to the environment? How much the area can support? How many living things, how many populations the environment can support? Now, ecologically, the uh, abbreviation for carrying capacity is K. Now, how much sense does that make? Well, don't be too judgmental because we tend to think, you know, we, we get uh, culturally arrogant sometimes. And so that's not based on an English word. It's based on a German word that starts with a K that literally means capacity. I can't pronounce the word because I don't speak German very well. But it's a long word, trust me. And it's got a lot of little <laughs> dots and accent marks and things like that. And I'd never be able to pronounce it correctly. But it's based on German, not English. So... Okay, all right, so what happens with populations? Well, we've already seen that when they grow with living systems, they typically tend to exhibit what we call exponential growth, growth by multiplication. Well, when you overshoot the carrying capacity, what do you think is gonna happen? You get what's called a dieback, right? Because once you exceed the carrying capacity of the environment, the environment can't support more individuals, that's going to affect the population. So it's going to drop back below that. And so what you would expect to see over time under normal circumstances, again, this is why this is a model, you would expect to see that overshoot and dieback sort of come to a, an equilibrium so that the population tends to remain around the carrying capacity. But guess what? I said this was a model, right? <laughs> You're assuming that the carrying capacity is going to remain constant. That doesn't happen in real life. Environments change. And so if you've got the carrying capacity constantly moving, you got to know that the subsequent graph is going to change as well. So, you know, a perfect example might be, say we're talking about a population of white-tailed deer. All right? Something <laughs> very, very common around here. And, you know, they're living in their habitat. What's a habitat? What, what do you guys tell students habitat means in, when they come in here? What's your working definition of habitat? Place where an animal lives. The place where an organism lives. And more importantly, in that habitat has to be what the organism needs, right? Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, we always used to say a habitat includes food, water, shelter, space, and a suitable arrangement. That was the old Project Wild definition uh, back in the, uh, in the 1990s when I took the course, but it makes sense. You gotta have food, you gotta have water, you gotta have shelter, you gotta have space, and they have to be in a suitable arrangement. By definition, that's habitat. So obviously that feeds into carrying capacity. And so our deer are cruising along one year, they've, they've gotten a nice equilibrium around the carrying capacity, and then all of a sudden, a developer comes in and wipes out 100 acres of forest and they've got no shelter, they've run out of space, and maybe they've had a drought 
So obviously the carrying capacity has tanked at that point. Therefore the population is gonna follow suit. So that's why we consider this to be a model. It's a good representation, but it's not always realistic. So real populations actually tend to fit somewhere in between what we were just discussing, uh, an equilibrium situation and what's called an opportunist situation. Two major dynamics, so let's, let's explain them. Different kinds of species out there are gonna have different kind of population dynamics. If you're what's called an equilibrium species, then your population is gonna be limited by its carrying capacity and it's gonna remain relatively stable. And since it is regulated by K, we say these species are K-selected. So what are the characteristics of K-selected species? They tend to be relatively large, they tend to have longer lifespans, they tend to have relatively few offspring, but the offspring that they do have, they provide a lot of care, what we call parental investment in them. So rather than dumping energy into having a lot of young, they have few young and dump the energy into making sure they make it to adulthood. What will be a good example? An elephant, okay? Obviously that fits the bill, relatively large, live long, 70, 80 years or more, uh, don't usually have but one calf at a time, but that calf's going to stay within the matriarchal herd for a number of years until it reaches adulthood. So that's one type. Now can compare or more obviously contrast that with what we would call an opportunist species. <clears throat> their population size is more limited by their reproductive rate. And for this reason, we say that these types of species are are selected. Pretty much the opposite of what we were talking about with case selected. They tend to be smaller, have short lifespans, produce lots of offspring, and little or no uh, parental investment. So things like a lot of the insects are going to do this. Okay, uh, they don't. You know, remember we raised uh, fruit flies in the genetics lab. You know, and the reason we did that was because their generation time was so short. I mean, within a couple of weeks. They had gone from egg to larva to pupae and then came out as adults. You could see the traits you wanted to see. Then they got put in the fly morgue, we called it, which is a little can of oil. And then, you know, after we, after we find those genetic traits. Um, but, you know, those, those flies inside those glass cages were not running around feeding the larvae and taking care of them. You know, they were just pretty much staying away from them. So they had done their bit once they produced all those eggs. So my question is, with regard to humans, would you say we are K-selected, an equilibrium species, or are selected a reproductive species? Relatively large, long you lived, relatively few young, but taking good care of their young, would that describe us? Yeah. yeah. So we tend to be a K-selected or equilibrium species. Regardless of how we do it, we've done a very good job of populating this planet. <laughs> or depending on how you look at it, a very poor job of populating this planet. Question is, what's the carrying capacity? Okay, we have managed to, to make a lot of change, because our, our lifespans didn't used to be as long as they are. So we've increased lifespans. We've helped people who would not normally be able to reproduce to be able to reproduce. We've had other medical advances, so, and, and why wouldn't we? I mean, those are very humanitarian things to do, but at the same time, we're really overpopulating this planet. What are we at, eight billion now? So, yeah, and when I think about, well, Glenn, when we, we uh, had the class uh, back in 2000, I was showing a video at that point, that at that point it was 10 years old, and at that point, the, the human population was only 5 billion. So in 20 years time, 3 billion people have been added to the planet. Pretty, pretty scary when you think about it. What's the carrying capacity? So what are other factors that affect populations? Well, obviously the production of new individuals, births are gonna affect that. And then there's some movement associated. You can have immigration where you get members of one population moving into another. Okay, there, we've got one population of zebra here, we've got another population of zebra here, but they're all the same species, and if they can interact and interbreed, then they become 
part of that population. Likewise, immigration with an E exiting the population, some individuals go out. So the population can change that way too. And this is something that's important because this is one of the things we call gene flow that allows new genetic material to come into a population and increase the variety of the genetics within that population. And then of course, <laughs> death rate <laughs> is going to affect uh, the population as well. Natality and mortality don't always cancel each other out. Okay, And of course now in the human population, natality uh, and mortality certainly don't cancel each other out. All right, so thinking about all those population dynamics, now let's move on to the next level of organization called the biological community. So how is that different than a population? How is a biological community, by definition, different than a biological population? It can be more than one species. That's right. So community represents all the living organisms, all the different species in a given area. Or if you prefer, all the populations in a given area and how they interact with one another. Because certainly because they're different species, they're not going to be able to, to interbreed, but they still have interactions that, that go on. So all the different species there. And to me, community dynamics is one of the most interesting aspects in ecology. First of all, because every organism in a biological community serves at least one function. And I use the word function, that's a little bit anthropomorphic, but there is a role that they play within the community, sometimes more than one role. And we call that role their niche or their niche, if you prefer. Um, I've always said niche. So that's the functional role that they play. So just like we were saying that we humans are all one population, so what would be your niche in the community here? What's, what's, what's your niche, John? Teaching kids about sharks. Okay. Is that the only one? No, of course not. You have multiple uh, functional roles that you play. Okay. So. That's gonna be the same here with other organisms as well. Generally speaking, we're gonna start with some of the, the large scale niches, and then we're gonna see that there's subcategories all the way through. So generally speaking, one of the primary niches, one of the most important niches in a biological community is that of being a producer. Because producers are the organisms that can conduct photosynthesis, and in doing so, they are providing a basic food source for all organisms in the community. Now, a plant, a producer, is doing this not out of the goodness of its heart because, oh, it's my job to feed everybody. No, no, a plant is producing glucose because it needs glucose to then turn around and use it for respiration to release its own energy, all right? Plants aren't making food to, for everybody else. That's not the intent. They're doing it for themselves, but uh, they are able to do something that I can't do because I'm not a producer. You know, they take the sun's energy, solar energy, and convert it into chemical energy that the plants use. In one of the previous uh, sessions, we talked about, you know, the actual uh, formula for photosynthesis. A plant can take carbon dioxide out of the air, it can take water from the ground, and then using this solar energy, certain uh, pigments involved, specifically chlorophyll, and using that light energy, it can then break apart that, uh, or rather, it can break apart the water, combine some of that hydrogen with the, uh, with the carbon, make a whole new carbon compound, glucose, and then get rid of the oxygen that it is a byproduct. I'm also glad they do that too, by the way, how I can, you know, can breathe. But see, I go out there and I stand in the sun, all I get is a sunburn, you know. I can't, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, lunchtime came around, you just walked outside and sat, sat down at the picnic table, but you didn't have to eat anything. You just sat there for an hour and then got up and went back to work. Man, I'm full. <laughs> was a, a lot of sun today, you know? But not the way it worked. It'd be a lot cheaper, too, wouldn't it? And then you could just, you need to lose weight, just stay inside for a little while. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Go sit in the dark for a couple of days. 
If only it were that easy. All right. So if you're not a producer, then you are some kind of consumer because consumers can't make photosynthesis, can't conduct photosynthesis, can't manufacture their own food. They must ingest or consume other organisms to do this. So again, if you're not a producer, you are some kind of consumer, and these are just a few categories of consumers. An herbivore is gonna be an organism that consumes plants, either an entire plant or part of a plant. A carnivore is gonna consume a part of or an entire animal. An omnivore consumes plant and animal. You guys know this. Scavengers consume things that are already dead, be they plant or animal matter. And then a decomposer has a more basic role in that it's going to uh, break down the organic matter into its more elemental components and get it uh, returned back to the soil. Because although plants use solar energy and carbon dioxide and water to manufacture glucose, they still require minerals and other uh, chemicals from the ground as part of their life process. And that comes from the decomposers taking it back to them in the soil. So let's look at the niche of being an herbivore. You're consuming plants in part or in whole. Now, most people and probably a lot of the kids that come in here, um, when they think about an herbivore, to them that's going to be a deer munching leaves off of a tree or a zebra grazing grass off the grassland. So basically, whether they know it or not, they're thinking grazer browser. That, that's pretty much the end of their knowledge when it comes to herbivore. But think about it. You consume plants, either a part of a plant or the entire plant. So if you're eating fruit, like a toucan, technically you're an herbivore because you're eating part of a plant, but we take it a step further and say you're a specialized herbivore called a frugivore because you're eating fruit, particularly. Uh, same with uh, the, the goldfinch there on the thistle. Okay? It's eating seeds. So that's still part of the plant, but that's gonna be its primary food. In fact, its, its bill, its beak, is adapted primarily for seed eating. Uh, the honeybee is going after pollen and nectar. Still parts of a plant, but very specialized parts, so they're nectivores. And then I just put a couple others on here. You've got a caterpillar grazing on a, or a browsing on a leaf there. And then it's a very specialized niche here. This is a marine iguana. And marine iguanas are the only marine lizards, the only lizards that live in the ocean. They live on the Galapagos Islands and they graze on the algae that grows on rocks in the Galapagos Islands. So a very specialized niche that they have there. But all of these are herbivores. Same principle applies to carnivores. They either consume part of an animal or an entire animal. So again, students gonna think, okay, a big predator. Oops, 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 oops sorry. Push the wrong button. <clears throat> students are gonna think something like a lion capturing an antelope, in this case, and then that's a water bug or what that is, but anyway, catching a larger animal. And chances are it's going to eat a good portion of that animal. But you can be a carnivore that specializes in eating insects, an insectivore like the praying mantis. You can be a carnivore that specializes in eating fish, a piscivore. Uh, a great white shark eating a, a seal, that's pretty much eating the entire thing certainly an example of, of a uh, carnivore, a snake swallowing its prey. And then you got things like the spotted hyena that not only can eat the meat, they can ingest bone. Their jaws are powerful enough to actually crack bone and consume it. And this was never more evident to me than walking around in Kenya in certain places and seeing these, these piles of dung that look like balls of concrete because these hyenas had ingested so much bone that that's what was left behind. You know, it's pretty, pretty amazing that they can do that. So different examples of being a carnivore. 
<laughs> yeah, but I, I, I don't think I'd want to come face to face with a hungry spot. Well, number one, you're probably not going to face just one. They tend to they travel in you know packs. So, uh, oh, no. <laughs> then of course you have omnivores, and a good example of that would be a single animal eating a lot of things. And again. This is something that might surprise most people because the black bear is a bear and it's in the carnivore order of mammals. People think that the majority of its diet is going to be meat, and that's not true. Um, a lot of the diet is quite seasonal. Yes, they will eat meat. They will hunt animals, but they will also scavenge things that are already you know, dead. They'll go after fish. When certain berries in the summer or spring are ripe, they love those. Uh, they'll graze on grass, and in the autumn, they love acorns. So, in fact, again, you can look at the scats of these guys, and they're going to look totally different in the spring than they do in the fall because of the, the diets that they have. But relatively small, a small portion of the black bear's diet is meat. It's mostly uh, vegetable matter of some kind, uh, herb herbivorous in nature. But that's why we call them omnivores. And then you've got the scavengers, the things that feed on things that are already dead. Now, this is not to say that a vulture won't take something, hunt something. This is not to say that an eagle won't eat something that's already dead. But generally, you've got scavengers. So, you know, we've all seen the snake that goes across the road and somebody actually makes a valiant effort to try to hit it. And, you know, and so they're dead on the road. And it doesn't take long for the scavengers to show up, you know. Um, and so it can be something as large as the vulture, but we're also mm. talking about other scavengers here, things mm. like, you know, mm. flies in particular. And while most of the flies that are landing on this snake, they themselves may not feed on it, but they're gonna lay their eggs on it. And of course, their larvae are gonna feed on it at that point. So they're eating something that's already dead. And then, like I said, you've got this more fundamental level of decomposer. These are typically bacteria and fungi of some kind that are at work breaking down material and returning the basic matter back to the soil. So fungi in particular are very important decomposers. For a while, uh, fungi were classified as plants a long, long time ago. But fundamentally, they're quite different. In fact, fungi are more related to animals than they are to plants. You get right down to it. But, you know, of course, fungi do not make their own food. They do not conduct photosynthesis. But something else is different about a fungus that makes it fundamentally different than even, even animals. When you know, you and I eat something, we sat down to a meal, first we ingest it, and then we digest it. Fungi do that the other way around. Fungi grow through a medium, whether it's the soil, or dead plant matter, or dead animal matter, and they secrete enzymes through their cells. And that begins to digest the organic matter around them, and then they absorb it. So they, digest it, and then ingest it. Pretty much the opposite of what we do. And that's why you see them growing a lot like, like you do. <clears throat> the main body of the fungus is quite often something you don't see. In other words, if you walk outside and see a mushroom, okay, that's classified in mycology, the, the science of, of fungal studies, as a basidiomycete, which means, you know, okay, that's a type of fungus, but that's not the body of the fungus you're looking at. That's the reproductive structure. The main body of the fungus, y'all, you dig down a little bit in the soil and you'll see this thread-like network of, uh, of fibers and plant-like things going all through the soil. So the mushroom is merely the reproductive part because underneath the gills of that thing, when it's uh, ripe, so to speak, there's spores that it uses to reproduce. By the same token, uh, if you have some food in your house, be it bread or cheese, and you go to get it out of the package, you say, oh, this has got mold on it. Okay. More likely to do this with cheese than with bread, I know. Um, I used to work in 
a deli way back in the day, a grocery store deli. And I won't tell you which one, but at least back then, you know, I was in charge of the cheese case. And so anything that we don't sell, you know, has to get weighed and thrown, it's called a markdown. We, that's lost money. So when we had the cheese case, you know, it was like, okay, there's, there's a little bit of mold on there. Cut that off, repackage it, and put it back out to sell again. Well, in general, that's what a lot of people do. They find a piece of cheddar cheese or whatever in their, their refrigerator. They cut the part off that's got the mold on it and eat the rest. Well, obviously, people aren't dying from doing that. But honestly, you're not getting rid of the mold when you do that. All you're doing is removing the reproductive part of the mold because the part that you see that's fuzzy and is white and green or whatever, that's the reproductive part that produces spores. The main body of the mold, the fungus, has already permeated the, the cheese or the bread or whatever at that point. And all you're doing, pardon me, is, is castrating the, the fungus. That's all you're doing <laughs> when you cut that off and, and get rid of it. So, okay, we've been doing that for years. We haven't keeled over yet, so I guess it's all right. But to some people, that would be an unsavory thought. You're still eating fungus. And, of course, there are plenty of fungi that we do eat. You know, mushrooms of a certain kind, blue cheese. Hey, there's a reason it smells like it does. It, that blue, and that's a mold. Well, we just happen to like that tanginess or whatever. So fungi are more prevalent. They're more important than we give them credit a lot of times. But they're certainly very important decomposers. <clears throat> so lest you think everything's about, you know, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, species do have specific types of interactions within communities. First of all, there's definitely competition. And competition exists because there's limited amounts of, of habitat components out there, food, water, space, territory, mates, that's also competition. And competition kind of helps keep species from sharing niches sometimes. So again, we think about competition on a grand scale you know, lions and hyenas are always in competition um, for food and things like that. <clears throat> Here we have two large antelope called oryx that are sparring for territory and probably mating rights is what, what we're looking at here. By the way, one of the things about horns and antlers that I like people to, to realize is that the primary purpose of horns and antlers is not to ward off predators. It's to attract a mate or intimidate or threaten male rivals with them. Because think about it. Look, look, at, look at those horns. What would an oryx have to do to get those horns in a position to be effective against a lion or some other kind of, of predator? Right. Not saying they won't try and they won't use them, but that's not what their primary purpose is. Also, if it's merely to fend off predators, then why are they all these different lengths and shapes and sizes and ornate patterns and spirals. You don't need all that just to be weapons. So as an exhibit we used to have here once said, they are more ornament than they are armament. <clears throat> so, and, and think about deer, not horns, but antlers. Typically only the males have them unless you're caribou or reindeer. And they don't have them year round, do they? They only have them during the mating season. So obviously those are not just meant to ward off predators or they'd have them year round. But competition can also exist among trees or plants because there's only so much light that's available. And if you're an understory plant and you've got canopy trees and whatnot above you, then light is going to be something you're competing for. If you're a barnacle on a rock in the, in the marine environment, you're competing for space to do what you need to do there. So competition is not always dynamic and forceful and violent. It, it happens all the time, and sometimes it's quite subtle. Interesting study that was done decades ago in a New England forest. Observations that we have uh, animals like these birds here. Uh, these are different kinds of warblers. Cape May warbler, bay-breasted warbler, myrtle warbler. If you know much about warblers at all, and we have lots of them around here too, especially in the spring and fall, what do they eat? Insects. Insects. And most of them have a beak that looks very similar. 
It's a very thin beak, and a lot of them are specialists at getting under tree bark and getting insects and larvae that are hiding under the tree bark. Well, that's great, except that every other warbler species in town is feeding on exactly the same thing, using exactly the same adaptation. So how do you avoid competition? So this study in this New England forest made these observations and realized these guys are partitioning the resource. Not that they got together and had a committee meeting and said, all right, you stay here, you stay here, and I'll stay here. No, it just so happened that the observations that this particular species tended to stay towards the top and around the edges. This one tended to stay towards the middle. And this guy tended to stay towards the bottom and also on the edge. And again, you'll see, it's not that they didn't go throughout the tree, but there's a general trend here that you see, upper layer, middle layer, lower layer, with regard to the way these species forage. So there is that type of resource partitioning that is observed in nature. <clears throat> then there's the ever-present, but also confusing, and I'll go ahead and say it, often misunderstood, symbiosis and when you ask a, a kid what symbiosis is they'll tell you that's two that's two uh, animals that live together and help each other out well that's one type of symbiosis called mutualism symbiosis by the very nature of the word literally means living together and as you well know you can live with somebody and you don't always get along okay sometimes you're at each other's throats sometimes you're trying to kill each other other times you're helping each other out. Sometimes you're just ignoring each other and there's no benefit or there's no help. Well, there's exactly symbioses that conform to all of those categories. So any association between members of different species is called a symbiosis. Would that count with having a pet? I would say having a pet is either, well, depending on the pet, it's either being a parasite <laughs> or uh, it's a commensal relationship where one benefits and the other one's whatever. <laughs> Hopefully it's mutualism where both benefit from the relationship, but it could be any of those. <laughs> <laughs> the predator-prey relationship is a type of symbiosis. That's counterintuitive, but it is because it's an association. One organism feeds on another where the predator consumes uh, all or most of the prey. We see that all the time everywhere. However, we often say that it only occurs between animals, when that's not the definition. One organism feeding on another can mean herbivores. You got an animal that feeds on plants, it's still feeding on another organism, that's, pre that's predation. That's predation. Okay. <clears throat> Parasitism, parasite-host relationship, one organism is living at the expense of another, but the intent is usually not to kill the host. That would be self-defeating. Now, some organisms do have a, a, a high parasite load and it ends up killing them, but it, from the perspective of the parasite, that's not what they want to happen. So, you know, classic example, ticks, fleas, things that draw blood from, you know, your pets or whatever. Um, 40 year old staying at home with their parents and they're leaving, you know, that, that's parasitism. So, plants also engage in parasitism. Um, there's these, and they, these things live around here. These yellow, they're called daughter vines. They're plants, but they don't conduct photosynthesis. They literally attach and draw nutrients from other host plants. Okay. Mistletoe is a semi or hemi parasite. It is green, but it also draws nutrients from a host tree as it uh, conducts its life processes. We, humans, are predators, all right? Most of us don't go out and actively, directly kill the food that we eat anymore. Some of us do, not me, but I mean, there are people that still go out and hunt deer and things like that, fish, whatever. But it's not a way of life like it used to be when we were hunter-gatherers, okay? But somebody, you know, the, the natural habitat of your T-bone steak is not the Harris Teeter meat cage, right? <laughs> At some point, that thing was walking around out in the pasture somewhere before it got dispatched in some means. You didn't do it, but indirectly, 
you're still responsible. So you're, you're, we're predators. And perhaps more importantly, we're parasites. Okay. We take nutrients at the expense of other animals. We drink milk from cows. We take eggs from chickens. Now, some would say, well, is that really parasitism? Because aren't we taking care of them, feeding them? Yeah, I think you could, you could say that. I mean, but, but if you were going out uh, and getting uh, these things from a wild animal, that probably is a better definition of parasitism. But let's think about this. Why is a female bovine producing milk? For its young. Like all mammals, is producing it for its young. They're not producing it for us, but yet we are collecting it, we're drinking it. Okay. Why? Why? Why cow's milk? Why not bear's milk? Why not whale's milk? Why not? Why, why, why just cows? And not goats, sheep, things like that. Because that milk is very close in composition, fat, nutrients to, to our own. About, you know, 3% fat, things like that. So there's a similarity that allows us to be able to digest that, and certainly not everyone can. Some people have issues with it. Plus, it would be hard to milk a bear. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I probably would. It'd, it'd be safer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, I love to think about um, whales, and of course, because they're mammals, and the young are nursing. You ever seen uh, how fast a whale uh, pup will grow? The mother's milk is about 30% fat. It's more, it's not really liquid, it's more of a milkshake <laughs> kind of a thing. So that's one of the reasons they grow as fast as they do. But a cow, three, three percent, not not much different than a human. But you know, in a sense, we are predators of parasites. Now here's mutualism. Both organisms are benefiting from the relationship. The classic example, insects, pollinators, and plants, you know. Insects are going after the pollen, they're getting the nectar, but in going from one plant to the other, they're transferring that pollen. So the plants are gaining a reproductive benefit. Plants can't get up and walk over to a potential mate and you know, start talking smack and have a date and reproduce and all that. They depend on other organisms to you know, transfer their pollen. Of course, the insect's getting a food benefit from that. <clears throat> Here's another example of mutualism, the case of the Organisms, the plant-like organisms we call lichens because it's a symbiotic relationship of a fungus and an alga. I specifically picked these two because these are ones we have around here. You see them all the time. This so-called uh, shield lichen and this old man's beard, usnea. But if you looked at them under a microscope, you'd see something like this. These are fungal cells and these are cells of an alga. Alga is singular of algae. So how does the mutualism work? Well. The fungus benefits because this is getting producing nutrients through photosynthesis. And here's an alga that has a place to live and thrive without getting dried out. It doesn't have to be in water. Okay? So both of these benefit from that relationship. <clears throat> now, probably one of the more difficult uh, symbioses to understand is commensalism. This is where one organism benefits, but the other one doesn't benefit, but also doesn't appear to be harmed by it. Uh, probably the best example that most people could relate to is the bird we call the cattle egret, or egret. Um, not only around domestic cattle, but the, the cattle egret has a worldwide distribution. So there's in the old world, they're in Africa, they're in Europe, they're over here. And they tend to hang out where these large mammals are walking around through grasslands and stirring up a lot of insects and whatnot. And these uh, birds are then feasting on those insects. Now, maybe that's helping the bovine out, less insects to deal with, but it's really not affecting the cow or the buffalo or the bison or whatever. Um, egrets definitely benefit from it. The clown or anemone fish and sea anemones this is a little easier understood now, thanks to uh, the Disney movie. Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. I couldn't think of the name of it, thank you. Um, because Nemo was a clownfish or an anemone fish, which is apparently immune to the venom of sea anemones, 
Sea anemones are very closely related to jellyfish, but instead of floating around with tentacles like this, they're literally upside down, stuck to the bottom, and their tentacles are upright. And they still have the stinging cells, the nidocytes or nematocysts they're called, that when something bumps into them, it fires the venom into the uh, animal, it paralyzes it, and then they draw it in and, and digest it. Well, these guys have a coating on their body uh, in their, the mucus that they produce that prevents them from being affected by that venom. So they can just kind of swim around freely through the tentacles of sea anemones and jellyfish. And it doesn't bother them. Now, obviously that affords them protection from other predators, other predatory fish, but it doesn't really benefit the sea anemone, but it also doesn't hurt it either. So commensal in nature. And then a more subtle form. This is something uh, called Spanish moss. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Unlike mistletoe, Spanish moss is not parasitic. It's not a parasite, it's an epiphyte. Epiphyte literally means a plant that lives on top of another one, surface, but there's no connection. It's not rooted into it, it's just there on top of it. And most of the time when you look at Spanish moss, you're like, God, it looks dead. Well, it's got this nice scaly coating to prevent water loss. Next time you're around some Spanish moss, do, give, do yourself a little treat. Take a handful of it, pour, pour your water on it, and watch it turn green right before your eyes as that scale then, and it starts to take in that water and turns green and starts producing a conductive photosynthesis. That's what it's doing. It doesn't do that until it rains or you know, has a lot of moisture available to it, but it's not drawing nutrients off the plant. So it's not a moss, even though it's called Spanish moss, and it's called Spanish moss because it looks like the old beards of some of the Spanish explorers. In fact, Talansia usnoides is the scientific name. Usne, same like usnea, that other thing we looked at that we call old man's beard. So that's that Latin word that means beard. But this is actually even more mind blowing. You're looking at a close relative of the pineapple right here. Spanish moss is in the bromeliad family. And during the summer, if you look at it with a little hand lens, you'll see little tiny flower, bromeliad flowers on it. It looks like little pineapples. It's amazing. And of course, that's how they reproduce. But it's a commensal relationship, not a parasitic one. So, knowing about mutualism, commensalism, predation, parasitism, what would you say this type of symbiosis is? You've got an impala, and you've got all these little birds on there. Now, maybe you know what's going on, maybe you don't. But what kind of symbiosis would you say this is? Mutualism. Why would you say it's mutualism? Both of you said it. Why, why would you say that? Because... One's get, the impala's getting the bugs taken off and the birds are getting food. Okay, and that's exactly what's going on. These little birds are called oxpeckers and they're not picky about the type of antelope they land on because uh, all of them are going to have bugs. So, and, and if you look at it, the impala seem to kind of be enjoying it. It's like, oh, it's about right silly. there. Get that one. <laughs> yeah, get that right there. That's it. Um, but, see, we know that's what's going on, so it's easy to say this is mutualism. What if, and there are birds that do this, what if this, these oxpeckers were going deep down in the skin and drawing blood? And there are birds that do that. What would that be? That'd be parasitism, right? And if we had the full-on Alfred Hitchcock effect, you know, and it stripped it to the bones, we'd have predation going on. Okay? But this is uh, mutualism. Another important concept to talk about with biological communities is the concept of the keystone species. It's a species that plays a major role in determining the structure of the community, but it seems to be out of balance or out of proportion. But if you take the keystone species out, it will alter the entire community. So we consider African elephants to be a keystone species because they are one of the factors that keep the grasslands or the savannas open because these guys love to munch on the tender parts of tree limbs and leaves, and if they can't reach the leaves, they'll push the tree over. You know, that's just plow it right down. And that's one way that the 
openness remains open in some of these, these habitats. So obviously the, the concept of a keystone species comes from the architectural component of a keystone. In an arch, you know, this classic uh, architecture here, it's that particular stone that keeps the rest of these from falling in on themselves because if you pull that out, the whole structure collapses. If you remove a keystone species from a community, it has the potential to completely collapse the community. And that's, there's a reason why there's a prairie dog up here, you know, giving this public service announcement because they too are a keystone species out in the prairies. Their communities of underground burrows are literally habitats for other organisms that depend on them to, to survive and to, to do their life processes as well. Communities change over time. This happens on a daily basis where, you know, we talked about niche, niches being important and they tend to avoid competition in some ways. And so if your niche is to be what we would call an aerial insectivore, that sounds like a fun job, doesn't it? I fly around all day eating bugs. I'm an aerial insectivore. Well, in the summertime around here, we've got these, we have swallows, we also have chimney swifts flying around. It's interesting, we actually have, a, have three shifts. Swallows tend to be active during a good part of the day. The swifts tend to come in towards the latter part of the day, going in the evening, and then they finally go in and the bats come out and they're being aerial insectivores. So changes in the community structure, literally it's a shift change. The same job's getting done, just somebody else doing the job of eating these insects on the wing. In certain parts of the world, obviously here, we have seasonal changes. Communities are gonna change their dynamic as well as their structure over time. Uh, not only the way plants and things look, but also sometimes you get actual movement. And if the environment becomes intolerable, you know, what are the only three things we say you can do around here? Adapt, migrate, or die. That's it. We should have a t-shirt made. Adapt, migrate, or die. Because that's it. That's all you can do. And so dormancy is an adaptation that a lot of plants have adapted. Some animals too, going into hibernation. Migration, they are moving out. Okay. And then, you know, otherwise you, th th there's nothing else to do at that point for survival. So that changes the structure of the community too. And then there's this concept of what we call succession, something that's a classic principle in ecology is that over the long term, a community is going to change if left to the natural processes. And this was pioneered in the 1940s and 50s in the North Carolina Piedmont, the study of what's called old field succession. And it's based on, you know, back in those days, there was a lot more agriculture. So when somebody abandoned an agricultural field and let it go, there's a predictable series of plant species that are going to come in over time until you reach what's called a climax community. So this is uh, one of my favorite areas because at Winthrop University, out in the research area, they show different successional stages in progress. So this is recently disturbed here, meaning it's, it's mowed. This side here represents five years of growth, but it's, you know, right next to this, so you can see what's happened if you leave, leave things alone. And then that's about 15 or 20 years of growth where you're dominated by pines and other trees. But eventually around here, you would expect to have a, a hardwood forest dominated by different species of oaks and hickories. There are still some pines that manage to hang on because we're right on the edge of the Piedmont heading into the sand hills where there's pine dominance but this is what we call the climax community. Climax because under normal circumstances, we don't expect something else to come in here and replace this community. It's gonna be self-perpetuating. Now, if you have a major catastrophe, storm or whatever that destroys this, it's gonna start the process back over at some point. But this is what we call secondary succession because it's in a place where something was living at one point. But then that brings up the concept of what then is primary succession? Well, that's basically somewhere where no life has existed prior to that. And anywhere you get brand new land showing up, you're gonna get primary succession. 
And the only way to get new land right now that I'm aware of is when volcanoes, you know, breach the surface of the ocean and you get that rock forming. Happening with Hawaii right now, it's happening with Japan, all these islands. It's actually the way we started out, a volcanic island arc about 600 million years ago, but you'll have to wait for the rest of that story till another session because we will talk about it. <clears throat> but here you've got nothing but bare rock and yet life shows up. So you literally have plants that can come in and take hold and draw nutrients and minerals out of that rock, start that, and then they die and form a vegetative mass for other things to come on. So that's the difference between what we call primary succession and then what we just talked about, secondary succession. <laughs> Any questions? You see why I think ecology is one of the more fun things to talk about. <laughs> and it is something that a lot of people are a little more familiar with. They find it more interesting. And I think uh, I think the kids probably gravitate towards that a little more too. So there's certainly lots in here in the museum we can we can talk about. I didn't even get into food chains. We can talk about that really with one of the last ones. But thank you guys. I always enjoy this. It's been fun. I hope you got a little something out of it. And I look forward to seeing you. Give us a commercial for next time. Oh, yes. Well, next time we will be doing part two of ecology, uh, ecosystems, and biomes. That'll be uh, in December. Yes. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thanks.